Again, we got 21 varieties of bananas and plantains here at Mosswood Farm Store that we're experimenting with. And my favorite of the large varieties, that is large plants that I grow here, is the ice cream. And you can see this bunch over my head here. It's got about 114 bananas on there. I'm expecting that'll probably weigh a good 50 pounds of food on wow. that plant. This one actually made it through the storm where it had a, a couple of twins that were the same age. They got taken out during the storm. Those weighty, tall, stalky trees got blown over really quickly in the storm. And this one was the only one that made it. I was really blessed. But uh, the more common variety that you see in Florida is this one on my other side here, which is the standard Orinoco, which is actually considered a plantain um, because it is a big starchy banana or fruit that does turn yellow and get sweet but it's not as good as like the dessert bananas that have just incredible flavors like the ice cream and the mysore and some of the other dessert what they call the triple a and double a plus whatever varieties those are really impressive but most folks that have bananas growing in their yard that didn't plant them here in florida is the orinoco um, it's a pretty well producer, but it does get tall, skinny trunks, they tend to fall over. But this particular stand was on the property when we bought the property. One of the reasons I decided to plant bananas back here is this one was doing as well as it was. And this one's got three stalks of fruit on it right now. So there's one. I see one nice way up there. One yeah. up there that's almost done. This one above your head. And then another one right here. And about six or eight of these mature trees came down in the storm. So if that hadn't happened, we might have more fruit on this stand. Um, and this is a stand of 25, 30 trees. In it's a there. huge so, clump. This one's yeah, not managed as well. I haven't, been thin I haven't been thinning the, this one as much. I'm just letting this one go. I'm chopping, dropping. I'm putting a lot of biomass on the ground underneath it. Um, and it is directly downhill from the drain of this earthworm bin. So it's getting a lot of its own fertilizer from that system. So it is definitely producing better than it would with no maintenance. But, um, you know, it's not my favorite. It was here to begin with. Um, so some of the other varieties that I prefer... Uh, are over here. Like I said, we have 21 varieties. Most of them are experimental, have not been proven here. Um, but I have at least six that have been proven here, and these are my favorites. Uh, as far as all around Ooh. production and structure, these plants are not wind sensitive. Uh, you can see how thick the trunk is. You know, 12 inch thick trunk on a nine foot tall tree with about 40, 50 pounds of fruit hanging off of it, no support necessary. Um, they didn't get blown over, they didn't get torn up. I mean, a little bit of shag on the leaves from the windstorm uh, during Irma, but other than that, they produce regularly every year. As you can see, the honeybees love the flower nectar. Um, and uh, this is the one that I would most recommend, and I found out is the most desirable in South Florida, this variety. Uh, when I was down there last year, this guy was telling me he would pay top dollar for Namwa trees, dwarf Namwa trees in uh, Homestead. Wow. So, uh, yeah, and I've got uh, the one that you gave me actually had fruit on it. Um, Sam's tie. Oh, really? Already? Yeah. It did fruit, but it was it got blown over. Oh, so you lost it. Yeah, okay. so I lost the first fruit. This, this this trunk right here had a fruit on it during the storm, but it got blown over. It's a dwarf but tie, too. Yeah, it, Yeah, and it's, you know, all green. You know, as far as the markings and coloration on it, it's pretty plain. But, uh, you know, I had it in the ground for less than a year, I think, I got it from you, and it started to fruit. So that one is going to be an interesting one to actually get the fruit off of. Um, we've got... Um, you already got three more there, too, right? right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it started pumping out. So Vienti Kohal is a small fruited, small tree, produces in like six to eight months, so it's one of the fastest to produce. It doesn't take up a whole lot of space, got really nice black markings on it. Um, some people really like it, some people aren't so impressed with it. Uh, Mysore is probably one of my favorite fruits. Uh, it's got a really ornamental trunk, it's got a lot of red coloration in the stems. Really delicious fruit, whatever reason, I didn't get any Mysore fruit this year. It's very strange. But I've got a lot of Mysore plants, and there's a stand there, there's a stand there. Neither one of them produced this year, so hopefully next year we'll have better luck with the Mysore. But again, the ice cream. Is that the ice cream again? The wow. ice cream again, very productive, you know, similar size fruit stalks, um, you know, 
hopefully that one will get another month and a half to two months before we get a frost which is not likely but uh you know we're gonna do some little irrigation experiment to see if i can protect these from the frost this year and just overhead spray some overhead water over the whole thing i'm gonna put a really high riser up on the top of the hill should have about a 40 foot shoot and if i can keep the air above the clump of bananas warm with the water then the whole stand should be protected so wow. we're gonna we're gonna see how that works i mean that's a lot of resources kind of wasted to not exactly wasted but utilized to protect some fruit but i mean if i were able to protect all nine ten of these bunches of fruit that i've got here that's hundreds of dollars yeah. so a couple of nights of water is not going to equate to hundreds of dollars worth of fruit you know, do you so. frost out here every year yeah, at least once. At least once. Yeah, okay. at least once. Uh, this past season was very strange. We had a good frost in November, and then a really hard frost in March. So we call it the St. Patrick's Day Massacre because it was warm for three months between November and March, and everything thought it was springtime. And this banana patch was huge and beautiful in March, and then we got down to 25 degrees for about an hour back here. And it just looked like Armageddon. Everything was <laughs> dead looking. I was distraught. I thought about giving up on my banana plantings. And then in a month, it all returned and just came right back. So, you know, it does look like, you know, hell for a while yeah, during yeah. the year. With herbaceous plants in, you know, semi-frost prone areas, you're going to have that. But it's, you know, six to eight months out of the year, it's beautiful, jungle-like. And then for a few months when it's really cold, you have to deal with... Um, you know the leaf damage but like I said before the leaf damage creates sun penetration to the ground so like after these get frosted and they lose their leaves the understory blueberries will actually get some sun and things like that so they'll come back with a vengeance and get more established before the canopy returns so you you deal with the cycles throughout the seasons and it can actually work out to your benefit right Love it. I remember last year you had some crazy gourd thing on here. Did you do that again? Yeah, or? I didn't do that again. Okay. Uh, what I have now is a mix. Um, there's ube on here. I see that ube uh, right there. Ube, yeah. And then we've got the chayote. Oh, so you have the chayote here so there's too. There's three different kinds of chayote on this trellis. Uh, only one of them, the common one, seems to be doing the best right now. But I got one variety from Josh Jameson. The spiky? Uh, no, the big elongated ones. Oh, yeah. They're like uh, eight, ten like inches long. Yeah, 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 huge meal. And then the other one is the land racer, the original variety that's completely spiky, that looks like an old medieval torture device, and wow. it's on here too, but it's not really doing all that well. One of the things I realized with this particular plant, being um, Mexican in heritage, it doesn't like a lot of water. And these are all in the ground here, and with all the rains that we had this summer, it actually suffered overwatering. Really? Too much water? Too much water. And this soil is hyper moist it's always wet uh, we can go three four months with no rain and you can dig down a foot or two and find water here so that's one of the reasons i planted the bananas back here is it's really rich soil it's always wet and i built the garden on contour so it can be flooded uh, for irrigation i just emptied my rain tank onto it yesterday because we've been a couple of weeks now without rain trying to get these fruit to mature so i don't want them to you know slow down too much now i remember an interesting aspect what kind of trees did you use for this trellis uh, yeah, this is a black locust. Um, so this is a pretty common tree in uh, you know the North America. It's native, but it's not very common this far south. Um, it's a nitrogen fixer. It's the hottest burning wood in North America. It is one of the most rot resistant woods in North America, next to cypress. I think it is the most rot resistant. Wow. It's way harder than cypress, so it's very strong much harder to cut it'll dull a saw blade you know so i cut the tree into three pieces wow. one two three and this was all one tree how'd you get the tree uh it fell down um so, so it was growing up here it, yeah it does wow. grow here um okay. and it, i actually found it growing on this property when we bought this property but this tree came from about two miles away it was in my friend's yard and got blown over they do have some pest issues this is one of the reasons they're not grown commercially because you could replace pressure treated wood with this because of how long it lasts wow but because it has a few problems it is uh quote unquote invasive but it is a native so it's aggressive it spreads it shoots up suckers all over the place and and it has thorns so most people don't like it um, but it makes one of the best honeys in the country if you have a big stand of black locust next to honey locust it's one of the rarer honeys there is just from the flowers just from the flowers wow. the flowers are edible they're really odiferous they smell like jasmine perfume 
Um, very pretty, um, but they're usually very high up in the tree and they're hard to get at. But uh, in France, they dip them in batter and fry them like fritters. Um, so it's got a lot of uses, um, and it's kind of my totem tree. For whatever reason, me and this tree resonate with each other, and, <laughs> and so I use it as often as possible. And I've got some that are growing still here on the property. This one lost its leaves, so I think it might it be yeah, it might be dead. Um, and it's probably the bugs, the pest that gets it. But it's got the it's a trellis for the ube right now, so I've got a nice potato growing up in there and that will get harvested this year and I'll use the wood if it doesn't come back um, from being dormant. So they do go dormant in the winter time. They lose all their leaves naturally, but this one lost it, lost its leaves about a month ago. So I think it might be toast. Wow. But, Did you just eat the yam like a potato or is that becoming bread? <clears throat> uh, you know, I'm going to experiment. I have a bunch of ube gro growing around here, but I really enjoyed the purple sweet potato bread that you're talking about. Yeah. So I used the Okinawa purple sweet potato for that and it turned out extremely well. I would have liked it to have been a little bit darker purple, and the ube is we'll much it. darker purple. Yeah. So yeah, to get some really dark purple bread, I'm definitely gonna do it. Um, so yeah, I've been experimenting with using all this stuff in my pastries. You know, we got a bakery here on site, obviously, and so the bananas go into banana bread. Um, I've even used some of the pickled flowers um, in some pizza one time. We were just playing around, and my buddy brought some pickled banana flowers, and we threw them on a pizza. It's not my favorite thing, uh, you know, you gotta like some bitter food yeah. to like the banana flowers, even pickled. This is the drum circle? Fire yeah, spot? we got a drum circle, a little seating area here. The kids like it, it's like a playground for the kids, just a pile of stumps, man, yeah. it's all they need, you know. Uh, so we got a little bit of annual garden veg production here. Uh, got some strawberries going, some lettuces, herbs for the bread, you know, cilantro coming up in here. Uh, you know, and this is all just, you know, raised beds, got logs underneath, logs around the edges, got turmeric ginger growing over here. You know, this is the, um, the manga, the curcuma manga, which is like the mango ginger, some folks call it. It's a milder turmeric, more yellow than orange, and really easy to eat, very palatable, very nutritious. Obviously got all the cancer fighting agents and everything like that that the turmerics have. So this is our wood-fired brick oven here at Mosswood Farm Store. Um, this is the third iteration of wood-fired brick oven that I've had on site here. I've expanded them a couple of times, made them a larger capacity, more bread, uh, more efficient. Um, this one has a uh, hardy board on the outside that'll end up covered with adobe like this as the finished structure, but you can see underneath layers of insulation. I've got adobe insulation, thermal mass, and old, uh, coffee bags as insulation as well. So I've used a lot of old materials, reused materials to insulate this. When I burn a fire in here and get this thing good and hot, it's hot for a week. Wow, so you didn't buy this oven anywhere, Joe? No, I built this oven myself uh, in 2008 was the first time. And like I said, I've rebuilt it a couple of times. I always reuse all of the old bricks. So there's over a thousand brick in this oven now because I've kept all of the brick from the previous ovens and just made it thicker and thicker. So if you take a look inside here, it's uh, 52 inches deep by 48 inches wide. You can fit 30 loaves of bread in there. And it's still, I haven't used it in four days, and it's still probably 200 degrees in there. Whoa. So you could dehydrate fruit in there right now. You can make beef jerky in there right now. You can infuse oils in there. So there's all kinds of things that you can do with these retained heat ovens as they cool off that you can't really do effectively in an indoor oven. Um, they heat much more efficiently because the heat is saturated in all 360 degree area of the oven, so it's coming from every direction. Much quicker cooking, much more efficient, much more flavorful food. Uh, anything that you cook in there tastes better, works better. So burn a fire in there, all of the bricks soak up the heat. What I have left is ash and charcoal. It either goes down the slot here as ash and I collect it later and it goes into the garden, or I take it out early and put it in here and snuff it out and make my charcoal. Whoa, you got some biochar coming so out, of the bio here too, huh? out of the system too. So this is not the cleanest biochar that you could make because if you do it in a retort situation, like I know that you're experienced with, yeah. you have biochar that doesn't have any ash on it. This has ash on it, so it's going to be more alkaline. But with most of what we're growing here in Florida, we want a little bit of alkalinity and ash can go a long way to making it alkaline without the use of lime, which is mined and is, you know, not environmentally sensitive as far as that yeah. yeah, Dolomite is not the greatest thing in the world because of the way we get it. So this is free material. 
So this is harvested from dead. Oops, sorry. Very good. Uh, Stormfall, especially during hurricane season, I have more wood than I know what to do with stacked up on the property right now. So that means free fuel for my baking system here. Um, I have a do have a gas splitter. You know, I don't split all my wood by hand, but I need a lot of firewood. So that's the only way I can do it by myself. But all of the waste of you know goes into the oven and then back into the garden. And uh, it makes it so I grow what you saw in the backyard earlier. It's a very healthy system that I've got going on here because of all the waste materials that get incorporated in the proper way. Now, did you follow design to build this, find yeah. some, some instructions? You give yeah. classes on this too, don't you, Joe? Yeah, I do. I give classes on this. Uh, Florida Earth Skills Gathering, um, Florida Permaculture Convergence. I'm going to be doing a workshop on the ovens and how to use them. Um, we've got a small one on a trailer that we'll be using at the Convergence in December. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. But originally we built uh, this out of a set of plans. Um, the guy here in North America that was the sort of the forerunner of the brick oven movement, his name was Alan Scott. He passed away a few years ago, but he designed uh, this particular model um, that was based on a Roman design originally. So these are thousands of years old. That's how long this particular style of oven has been being used. And they can be modified in different ways. This one is called a retained heat oven, where, like I said, you burn the fire inside and the bricks soak up all of that heat and then release it slowly. You can also build a direct fired oven where you would have a fire going underneath and you can keep the temperature up constant and more regulated, um, but it burns up a lot more fuel to use those. So the retained heat ovens are great because you can use that difference in temperature as it drops over a couple of days. You can plan an entire menu. So you can go from pizzas at 700 degrees to breads at 500 degrees to roasted chickens, turkeys, whatever at 450, pies at 350, and so on and so forth. As the temperature drops, you can cook for this entire town in this oven off of one good fire. Because so I can fit six turkeys in here. Wow. You know? All <laughs> so, the way down to your dehydration of the beef All the way turkey. down to 110 degrees. Yeah. Wow. Make, you can make yogurt in here when it's nice and you know really low on that temperature scale. Roselle so, yeah. tea, the whole yeah, thing. All yard. of it. Yeah. Wow. Anything. Dehydrate anything, preserve foods, dry meats. Like I said, it's really more functional than any other oven. It's a lot more fun to use. These things attract people. Fire attracts people. It's been doing it for a million years, yeah, right? right? So people congregate here, especially when it's cold out. You got this warmth pumping out of here. And this is a community building space. I mean, people commune around food, they commune around fire, so it, it's got a lot of applications beyond just the efficiency of cooking with wood and things like that. It's, uh, it's really a, a, a beautiful thing. And it'll look a lot more beautiful when it's finished. I've had a hard time finishing it because I always think of something else I want to do with it, and to finish it would mean I'd have to undo all of yeah. it. So making these panels removable and the sheet metal is removable, so I like being able to adjust and fix things easier. Um, they always going to need repair because it's kind of like a living thing. It breathes. Every time it gets hot, it swells a little bit and then it cools off and it shrinks. So there's like constantly these little cracks forming and bricks that are coming loose that have to be patched. And I just haven't found a way around that. <clears throat> so it's, it demands some interaction over the years kind of thing. So pretty awesome. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's very awesome. It's taught me a lot. I really love working with them and uh, teaching folks how to work. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Joe, you could save me some time here and save them some time. Yeah. I know I'm going to get a lot of questions about Joe and his oven and, <laughs> yeah, and questions. If they want to ask you a question, can they email you? Or Yeah. Uh, so my email is cyberjoedaddy at gmail.com. Cyberjoedaddy. So, yeah, right. Any questions are welcome. I'd love to the, you know hear anybody that's interested. If you want to come to the store and check it out, I'm here five, six days a week. Stores on social media? Uh, yeah, we're on Facebook, Mosswood Farm Store. Absolutely. Okay. Very cool.